Hi, this is Emma Sutherland. Join us on FX Medicine next week, where I'll be talking to Dr. Douglas Jones about the treatment of food allergies. Subscribe to us on your favourite podcast app and follow us on social media to make sure you never miss an episode. Hi, and welcome to FX Medicine, where we bring you the latest in evidence-based integrative, functional and complementary medicine. I'm Dr. Michelle Woolhouse, and joining us on the line today is Professor Craig Hassard. Craig is the founding director of education at the Monash Centre for Consciousness and Contemplative Studies. Craig is renowned for being a pioneer in the use of mindfulness meditation within the medical world and beyond. He's been a meditation teacher for more than 30 years and was a founding president of Meditation Australia. He's with us today to discuss psychoneuroimmunology, a term that may be unfamiliar to many, but it is the term that we will learn underpins the important area of mind-body medicine. Welcome to FX Medicine, Craig. How are you? Hi, Michelle. It's great to be with you again. Psychoneuroimmunology isn't a term that has gone viral yet, but for me... It was the most profoundly inspiring discovery in my whole medicine journey. It used to be considered a pseudoscience. So, Craig, what is psychoneuroimmunology and what does it mean for our understanding of whole person medicine? Well, I I guess, Michelle, it's all in the name, really. Psycho, the mind, neuro, through the nervous system. Um, Immunology, uh, it talks to the immune system. So whatever goes on in our mind... Um, it has effects in the brain and that talks to the rest of the body and uh, including the immune cells and change how they function and therefore have massive implications for health. Because it was thought that the immune system is just a bunch of cells going around doing their own thing and yes, immune cells talk to other immune cells and so on. But in the in the um, mid-70s, um, uh, there were some interesting discoveries that uh, <laughs> really quite surprised people. Uh, um, for example, Robert Ader, who pretty much is the, the father of the modern science of, mind, uh, of um, psychoneuroimmunology, um, they were doing studies looking at the effects of chemo on uh, um, on mice, the immune cells, and they were trying to use this to work out what kinds of doses were safe or not safe for humans, and um, and and they were giving them this um, sort of very controlled diet, including this sort of saccharin water, which um, would uh, give it the taste of being sweet but uh, not provide any calories. So it was a very controlled diet, and they were dosing them with chemo and so on, and and then on occasions they'd just give them the the saccharin water but not the the chemo. And, and they noticed that the immune system of the uh, of the mice behaved as if it just got another dose of um, the chemotherapy and mm-hmm. went into quite profound immunosuppression again. And they said, wait a sec, did somebody give the chemo by mistake? And, wow. and, um, and they thought, what happens if we give the chemo again? And, um, and the immune system would crash again. And they, and they said, wait a sec, we're, the, the, the mouse is associating the taste of this saccharin water with the chemo and having an effect on mm. the immune system. This is classical conditioning. It's classical Pavlov's, system. yeah. And, Amazing. Um, so they started to look closely at um, uh, immune cells and lymph glands and they, and they thought, well, let's, let's stain them up and look for nerve fibres. And sure enough, they found nerve fibres all the way through um, lymph glands and in other lymphoid tissue around the body. And they said, well... well it wouldn't be there unless the central nervous system was communicating with the immune system. And then they started mm-hmm. looking for um, immune, uh, neurotransmitter receptors on the surface of white blood cells, and they were finding them all. And they wow. said, well, that was, there's something going on there, and that's really where the whole story sort of began, took off from mm. there. And so what was so fascinating to me when I first started learning about this was that there's a bi-directional communication between the immune system and the brain and the yeah. brain and the immune system. And that was just mind-blowing to me because in in my health education, it was always like this top-down heavy response to the body. So the brain was kind of the governor, but yet we now know 
that the immune system talks back to the brain. Tell us about that. Yeah, yeah well, that's right, because these immune cells actually, um, you know, send out hormones and neurotransmitters and so on that talk back to the brain, particularly the prefrontal cortex, which is interesting. So we found yeah. that that's a very important area of the brain for regulating the immune system. But uh, also the limbic system, so emotions are, are very central in um, in the regulation of immunity. And, and it's not surprising because any health professional who's um, ever listened to a patient has um, heard from them about how, well, when I get stressed or get very angry or going through a difficult time, you know, my you know, inflammatory condition flares up or my pain gets worse and so on. And patients have been telling us for a long time and that mm. should have given us pause for uh, consideration. But uh, <laughs> That's right. you know, science sometimes takes a long, long time to catch up to the obvious. Yeah, but um, it is absolutely profound. I mean, we know in terms of pain medicine how profound the stress response is. But I think sometimes when we're looking at the physical aspects of, of people's issues like inflammation, that we, we tend to kind of, we, we don't make that connection so easily. And, and we now realise that there's, that it's, the whole process is much more nuanced than we thought. You know, so, you know, if we sort of say, oh, well, we now know that, um, say, significant stress will suppress uh, immune resistance to uh, infections, you know, mm. viruses and so on, and if one gets a an infection will be more severe. So, you know, it's one thing, but um, but wait a sec, inflammation gets worse at the same time. Yeah. So it suppresses immunity, but we get more inflammation. Now that kind of doesn't make sense unless we now know that there's a, a thing called immune dysregulation. Mm. So we get the worst of both worlds with poor yeah. mental health. And um, because it's, it's not just stress, I mean, the, the whole poor mental health, um, including anger, significant anger. And so this, mm. these sorts of significant and especially chronic effects on uh, our emotional state um, will dysregulate the immune system. So we get less resistance, but we get more inflammation. Yeah. You know, when you flip that the other way, I mean, that's the negative side of the story. And if ever you find yourself talking to a patient about this, <laughs> by the time you finish telling them all this information, they'll be feeling stressed, anxious and depressed. That's right. So you, you very quickly exactly. got to get to the positive side of the story. <laughs> that is everything that you do to help, you know, um, the health, your, your mental and emotional health has a, is a positive investment in your immunity. So it'll have a, an immune re-regulating effect. So it'll boost your resistance, but at the same time, it will have an anti-inflammatory effect, um, which is a win-win situation. I noticed in your book, I was just rereading, I I went to have a look at it as I was preparing for this podcast and all of my highlighting had faded. So I had to go and um, (laughs) re-highlight it. It It was a bit long ago when I first came across your amazing book, Essence of Health, that you had a term in there, which I loved, which was called the, a brain renovation. And I guess we could call it an immune system renovation, where yeah. by using a lot of these positivity mechanisms that we can then go and, and really enhance our immune system or enhance our stress resilience or enhance our mental health. Yes, that's right. And um, b- because all of these systems are interconnected and and this sort of... The, the approach to medical education, probably less so in uh, training, um, you know, complementary uh, medicine practitioners because you know, sort of the holistic um, mm. kind of model is it, much more um, fully adopted in, in that. But in medicine, there was this systemic approach to the body and to education and um, oh, let's learn about the immune system. Let's learn about the gut. Let's learn about the immune system. Uh, the so all of these systems, the nervous system, um, were taught and then practiced in medicine as if they were independent things. Mm. And that's like you know, um, well, you know, you you're in a, a city like uh, Melbourne or Sydney or somewhere else, and that's like saying, well. The traffic uh, is independent, uh, the circulation is independent from, you know, um, industry that's producing stuff. You know, I mean, everything in a city is interrelated. 
Well, we saw and that with COVID, how interconnected our our infrastructure is. Yeah, you can't mm. affect one part of it without having flow-on effects to everything else. And um, so this is a, a total fabrication in the mind of um, modern medicine uh, that unfortunately um, has persisted for, uh, well, decades, um, perhaps uh, generations. And yeah. so it has to be dismantled again and actually um, come back to the obvious and that all of these systems are interrelated. So, you know, and every time you make a positive investment in one way, it has positive flow-on effects in the other. And that, that's the really optimistic sign or, or, yeah. or message, I suppose, from a therapeutic perspective. Well, absolutely. And I, and I think, you know, so much research has gone on for the last decade with regards to the gut biome and the gut being the second brain and all of this um, incredible information has come through our, I guess, symbiotic relationship to bacteria. And I think one of the profound aspects of that was that, you know, we, we know that most of our immune system lives inside our gut. And so then that further extrapolates the importance of this holistic picture. What do we know about psychoneuroimmunology and gut health and the gut biome? What's the latest on that? Well, look, it's just really, you know, opening up that uh, we realise if we don't have like a good diet, for example, and we're having lots of things like antibiotics and a lot of processed foods and various stuff. So if we if we have a negative impact on the gut biome, microbiome, then that has effects on the absorption and how leaky the gut is. Things get through, has implications for um, allergies and immunity. And so, it, it, again, it's, a, it's like a, a really new... Uh, well, it's not really new because, in, uh, you know, people have been talking about this for a few decades now as well. Yeah. <laughs> but we're, we're, we're just a bit kind slow. Of in medicine, <laughs> starting to catch yeah. up that... Look, I, look, I've been in medical education for 33 years now, and I'd like to say we're so much at the cutting edge, but uh, so much of the time, actually, um, we're lagging behind. Mm. <laughs> and uh, so we're just starting to realise that the healthy gut um, is a really important foundation for health of other systems as well. Mm. And um, and that, but that's that's bi-directional too, isn't it? It's like yeah. with the. The health of the brain and the health of our emotions impact so significantly on the gut and the gut biome. Well, that's right. And that's kind of been recognised for, for a bit longer as well in that, you know, if you get very extremely nervous prior to exams and so on, people would often say they get queasy in the stomach. And, and we kind of realised from early research on the, um, the fight or flight response that you know, that has implications for gut motility. And um, so a lot of symptoms that people experience when they're very stressed um, kind of centred on the gut. But we're now realising that this sort of, um, is, this is a two-way thing um, mm-hmm. as well, that uh, the health of the gut can have implications also, not just for the health of our immunity, but also for our mental health as well. Because yeah. this sort of chronic inflammation that's set up um, through very poor gut health um, has significant implications. The mental health is important, uh, one of them. Everybody has been talking about, oh, the importance of serotonin, you know, for mood and so on. And serotonin mm. is an important mood chemical, there's no doubt about it. Um, but serotonin is not the only thing affected, um, you know, with, uh, um, uh, in, you know, depression. And so inflammation is an important part of that as well because, pro-inflammatory cytokines, so these kind of chemicals, mediators of the immune response, uh, when a lot of those are being produced, they actually act on the central nervous system to produce what's mm. called the sickness response. Mm. And so, um, so, for example, you know, if you've got, if you've got the flu, um, mm. these cytokines will have effects on the brain that kind of you know, you've got no you motivation, you've got no yeah. energy. And it, it's like nature's way of saying, go to bed. Rest. Yeah, rest. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to put you to bed and I'm not going to, you know, uh, you know, make you want to feel like doing anything else. And yeah. so you go to bed and you rest and recuperate and then a few days later you get out of bed and hopefully all right again. 
That's um, so fascinating because we, we get so many people in our clinics that come with this pervasive sense of fatigue and lack of apathy and motivation and yet we rarely think about the role of of the, you know, a cytokine inflammatory storm, you know, for, for that regard. I mean, this, this kind of opens up our possibility of thinking along those lines for people, you know, that, that come in, that we haven't found any other functional reasons for why they're fatigued. Well, that's right. And so it's not like it's going to be the explanation for fatigue for every patient, but for a significant proportion it will be. Mm. And, um, and so, and in depression, for example, there's a lot of, because of the effects of allostatic load, and we can talk more about that in a moment if you'd like to, but the, the, these um, cytokines that are a part of that, um, you know, a lot of the symptoms associated with depression in relation to appetite and energy and motivation have got nothing to do with serotonin. Mm. Um, have got to do with these uh, cytokines and the sickness response, uh, also with dopamine pathways and so on. And so we just think, oh, it's, it's a serotonin thing. That's a very convenient explanation, um, you know, in thinking, oh, well, we're just going to prescribe antidepressants. But that's only going to touch a small part of, mm. um, of uh, the effects of depression. And so when you actually take a much broader approach... And we're now starting to realize that um, diet and improved gut health is an important part of the recovery for, from depression for a significant mm. proportion of people. The Food and Mood Center at um, Deakin University have um, uh, done a lot of uh, fantastic work, and they're not the only people in the world that are doing this, but realizing that dietary interventions, healthy diet, um, uh, is an antidepressant. <laughs> and one of the Amazing. important explanations for that uh, is probably because of these effects on inflammation, mm. uh, as is exercise, an antidepressant, as is getting some regular sunlight, an antidepressant, as is sleeping well. Um, so, so all of, you know, it, I've always sort of thought myself since, you know, my, my teenage years that all of these things are interrelated. The Barry Commoner's uh, first law of ecology was that everything is related to everything else. I think that's a good way of thinking about health as well. I mean, we've got all these amazing techniques that have come in the last couple of decades. For example, MRI has really changed the way that we see the function of the brain and functional MRI has changed that as well. And that's made a profound difference between seeing the role of letting go of stress or things like mindfulness meditation or transcendental meditation on the actual structural MRI changes of the brain. Tell us a little bit about that because you mentioned before about the prefrontal cortex and the limbic system being involved and heavily kind of attached to the immune system and the immune response. Yeah, it's, um, it's interesting. Uh, again, one of the other things that have been taught for a few generations, which is now being untaught slowly, <laughs> is that the brain... <laughs> The brain um, produces all its cells and wires itself in um, by late childhood. And then essentially the adult brain um, doesn't do anything other than lose brain cells over time and uh, gets clogged up with uh, amyloid. It's not a very uplifting um, story. (laughs) No, no. so we kind of got the brain and we poured it in reinforced concrete and said it doesn't change. And, um, well, that's just ridiculous. Now we know, of course, it does change. Mm. And um, so every time we think something, do something, react in a certain way, the, the brain and certain circuits are active, other circuits are not active. And when you activate circuits, you reinforce connections and mm-hmm. um, and in, indeed new brain cells, even in the adult brain, so neurogenesis. So. So if you learn to play the piano or if you, you want to become a London London taxi driver and you've got to yeah. <laughs> you've got to develop the knowledge that is learn all the streets of London and, and so on, you then you know, if you measure your brain, you know, twelve months later, the brain will have changed, not just functionally mm. but anatomically. Uh, grey Amazing. matter thickness in those areas of the brain that are being stimulated will grow. And um and uh, like the memory circuits and, and you know, uh, spatiotemporal, you know, circuits of the brain, um, executive functioning areas of the brain, areas of the brain associated with finger movements if you're learning the piano. So 
point is that the brain is plastic, not just neuroplasticity, but neurogenesis as well, new brain cells. Mm. And now from a meditation point of view, um, this is a workout for the brain, especially the attentional circuits of the brain, Mm. the singular gyrus and also the insula. And there are a number of areas of the brain that are kind of getting a workout when Mm. we practice meditation. And and those areas of the brain that get the workout are slightly different from one form of meditation to another, depending on what kind of meditation a person's practicing. But if you take mindfulness, where most of the research is, um, then that literally changes the gray matter density um, in some important areas of the brain, especially the attentional circuits. Now, attention is so important for, say, memory. A lot of people worry about their memory. Oh, I've got a terrible memory. I can't remember stuff. And it's not the memory. It's the attention. Yeah, If the person's not right. paying attention, the memory circuits are offline. That's right. And if we continually don't pay attention, then the memory circuits are continually offline. And that's our way of telling the brain, I don't need those circuits. I'm not using them. So the brain will prune them back through disuse, like a muscle that's not being used. It wastes away a bone that's not being used. It gets osteoporosis because the body says you don't need that. Well, we'll just <laughs> I'll just um, dismantle it. It's such a great way of thinking about it because I know a lot of people are worried about their their memory. And recently in clinic, I really noticed that more and more people, even at younger ages, are actually complaining about memory and cognitive impairment and foggy brain. And that was never discussed twenty years ago. That, that whole no. concept of foggy brain didn't exist 20 years ago. And now it's kind of like even in the medical software, they've got a tick box that says foggy brain. And, um, yeah. it, you know, I think really thinking about how empowered we are to be able to actually dense, make it, make our brain denser because it doesn't – I was reading a, a study, um, Richard Davidson's study of – of looking at beginner meditations and they had quite profound changes within about, was it eight weeks of yeah. doing a beginner meditation course? So it's not, it's not like it's a, you have to be a serious monk, um, no. you know, for four hours a day to, to see these changes that it doesn't take as long as what people actually think it does, which is so inspiring too. Yes, that's right. So, you know, after six or eight weeks of practicing these kinds of skills and the person's not practicing memory tasks, the person's practicing Mm. attention through meditation, but the memory circuits will change. Also, the emotion regulation circuits change. Um, Also, the areas of the brain associated with uh, interoception, that is your ability to be in touch with your body, change. Mm the ability to switch attention, um, the ability to process information. So a lot of executive functioning circuits get a workout through the practice of meditation. And this, of course, has flow-on effects into the person's day-to-day life. Oh, I'm working better, I'm I'm making better decisions, I'm processing information better, I'm I'm getting less emotionally reactive. They lose their keys less. (laughs) Yes, that's right. (laughs) Because... You know, you just even in simple ways, you know, a person, you know, um, walking away from their car to the office, for example, mm. and halfway to the office, did I lock my car or not? Yes, yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, it saves yeah. so much time. Well, that's right. Will I keep walking or will I go back and check? And then and there's this sort of internal agitation, go back and check. Oh, yes. But it, we did it on automatic pilot because the mind was already thinking about the stuff I've got to do at work. So in that one second that that little button on the key ring was being pressed, we weren't paying attention, so it doesn't register in memory. Mm. It's interesting when um, uh, we've known for a long time that, um, well, you know, the last 15, 20 years, that, that, um, uh, that meditation practices change the brain and um, generate new brain cells and slow the loss of brain cells. So by about the age of 50, one recent study was um, showing that people who practice these kind of skills regularly, their brains are about seven and a half years younger than people who don't. 
which um, I don't know uh, which side of 50 uh, <laughs> many of our I'm listeners will be under. on, but I can, <laughs> I can assure you that becomes a more and more attractive option all the time. And mind it you, sure if you does. practice too much meditation, you wind up with the brain of a five-year-old, which is probably not quite so good, but anyway. <laughs> so there's kind of a point. There's like a, a sweet spot. <laughs> yeah, I want to be 21. It, it. <laughs> there's a lot of talk about holding our trauma and emotions in the body now, and there's a there's a whole kind of new way of discussing trauma like through the the vagus nerve plays a role in the parasympathetic nervous system what does all that mean like what do you think they mean by holding the trauma in in your body and does that change the way we think about emotional well-being as a as in that whole person care yes it's it's um this is an interesting and important area but i think it's a very difficult one to be precise about in the way that we, that, uh, we might like like to be. So, you know, it, it's, it would be hard to say that, um, for example, and, and it depends uh, psychologically on a deep level, a person might express certain symptoms uh, even unconsciously associated with past trauma with particular areas of the body. It's very hard to join all the dots. Mm. from a a psychological, emotional experience and then all of the biochemical and neurological pathways that mean that that therefore expresses itself in those particular uh, symptoms in that part of the body. Mm. Um, It's hard to join all those dots and to be 100% sure, um, you know, about that. That doesn't mean, of course, that it's not. It just means that that's a very difficult thing to prove. Yeah, it's so nuanced and... Abstract. That, that psychological, like events, past experience, can have significant effects in the body and even in our DNA. Mm. So if you look at, say, people who um, might have been two generations removed or one generation removed from Holocaust survivors, um, the people who went through the Holocaust, um, extraordinarily um, stressful uh, situation, and that that had effects on the DNA, their chromosomes, especially areas, the, the segments of chromosomes that regulate the stress response. So it was like um, people coming away from that situation, there were epigenetic changes to the chromosomes, uh, segments that regulate the stress response. But what they've found is that those changes can be handed on to the next generation and the next generation. Um, That's incredible. Which is uh, interesting. Um, other things have gone back many more generations than that, perhaps even three or four. And we, we don't, it's very hard to keep going back because we don't have the data from hundreds of years ago. Yeah. But the lifestyle that your grandparents or great grandparents led, for better or for worse, um, is expressing itself in your DNA now mm. <laughs> through epigenetic changes. Not changes in the the makeup of your DNA, changes in the way that your DNA functions and expresses itself because of all of the things around the DNA that are turning on and turning off particular chromosomes mm. or segments of chromosomes. And um, so these kinds of traumas, even from a generation or two back, uh, can have flow-on effects even through generations. So in a kind of a way, is it nature or nurture, you know, for the next generation to um, have problems? Well, it's probably both, both. like with everything, yeah. that it's <clears throat> it's nature what we're sort of born with, um, but it's also nurture the environment that we're brought mm. up in. And um, so it's. I think it's always going to be a combination of those two things. So... It's held in the body, but it even seems to be held in the, the DNA. It was interesting, um, a- animal studies you can do that you can't really do on humans. They looked at giving, um, a, again, a, a conditioned response in mice. So they would um, give them the smell of orange blossom, and at the same time um, they would uh, give them a little electric shock. So they'd do that a few times so that the animal, the mouse quite quickly... Um, related the smell of the orange blossom to an electric shock. So when it was presented with the orange blossom smell by itself, Mm. it would start shaking as if it was about to 
receive a shock. And then, <clears throat> then they um, got those those male mice to to reproduce. So the next generation comes along, but and then they the expose the next generation to orange blossom. They've never been shocked, but they just give them the smell of the orange blossom, and uh, the um, the mouse starts shaking, um, having a, a, a quite extreme stress response, even oh though it had never goodness. been shocked or never been practically oh. conditioned. <laughs> That is unbelievable, isn't it? I mean, wow. We don't know the implications for all this. We, This is just like if we we're landing on a continent, uh, it's like we've just landed on, on the yeah. shore and, and we've got this vast <laughs> continent to explore and we've only seen about a few square metres of it. Yeah. Um, this is uh, un, 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 uncharted waters. territory. But you talk, I've heard you talk many times, but you talk also about the role of mindfulness on telomeres and longevity and cancer protection as well. Like, so this isn't just on our immunity to protect us from uh, viruses or bacteria or, or inflammation. It can even go as far as having influences on our risk of cancer Tell us about the links and what the, the science is, is saying about the role of telomeres and, say, mindfulness or, or other forms of meditation. Yeah, but, well, there are lots of dots still to join, but um, what, what's been known, and mainly through the work of Elizabeth Blackbird, who won the Nobel Prize for discovering telomeres, she's an Australian scientist working in the States, and uh, she and um, her main... Um, colleague in this area of research, Elisa Eppel, um, they're looking at the effects of significant um, chronic stress, uh, poor mental health, uh, anger and hostility, and these things were actually having an effect of shortening telomeres. Now, for those uh, listeners who are new to sort of understanding about telomeres, if you imagine your chromosomes as long coiled up molecules of DNA, on the end of the chromosomes are these little caps called telomeres, and they stop the DNA from un uh, unraveling a little bit like the plastic bits on the end of shoelaces stop shoelaces mm. from unraveling. <laughs> and then as we age and every time our cells divide, those telomeres are getting whittled away at the end, shorter and shorter. And as they get shorter, the DNA starts to unravel and mutate and get damaged. And, and essentially they've found that the shorter the telomeres, the older we are and the bigger the risk of the illnesses that we associate with ageing, like cancer and heart disease and dementia. So big implications for health, although I've just told the story as if it's kind of one-dimensional, but we know that there, there, there are sort of subtle um, sort of um, variations of that story, but that's the kind of overall story. We're still trying to work out the whole well, I'm saying we, I'm not one of the researchers in this area, but uh, the, the uh, scientific community is still trying to work it out, the full story. But um, so, for example, um, one of the first studies was looking at women's, women who were carers for children with major chronic conditions. And they found that, you know, by the late 30s, um, women were 9 to 17 years older as far as their DNA was concerned compared to women who were um, uh, mothers of children but without chronic conditions. So just the in effects of carer stress could be that significant. Yeah, which is um, so significant. And, and so we know, and, and you know how people who, who've been through the ringer in their life had, and mind you, I should say as well in that study, it depended on how well or poorly the women were coping with those demands. Mm. Because women who were in that situation but were coping well emotionally um, compared to the women who are coping poorly emotionally with that um, situation. The women who are coping poorly um, were 9 to 17 years older as far as their mm. DNA was concerned. And that's important and so because it the gives situation the... as much as how yeah, the coping. people cope with it. Anger and hostility, particularly for men, uh, associated with shorter telomeres, um, much more so than for women. Uh, anger and hostility is um, much more a male uh, problem I mean, mind you, ma oh, male no. anger and hostility can cause <laughs> massive problems for everybody for involved females. with the uh, uh, yeah. with the man. But um, you know, so the, but it particularly affects 
males. Now, so that's the negative side of the story and unhealthy lifestyle, short telomeres, etc. But um, some of the interesting research um, since 2000 and um, uh, the early uh, 2010s has found that um, the practice of meditation um, actually switches on the telomerase. That's the repair enzyme um, that repairs and renovates the, the telomeres, if you like. So if that telomerase is working, then the telomeres don't shorten nearly so fast. And um, so that will start to happen within a week of a person um, uh, learning and practicing meditation regularly. That's incredible. But if you follow over the longer term, um, what it translates into is longer telomeres. And um, so, for example, women with um, breast cancer who practiced, um, were taught and practiced mindfulness regularly, then their telomeres stopped shortening uh, compared to the women who had breast cancer uh, and who were not practicing mindfulness, and of course the psychological stress associated with that is significant. The a study on middle-aged men um, who um, not only learned um, mindfulness practice but also took up a healthy lifestyle, what they found was that they started to regrow telomeres. And right. um, so that, that, that is a genetic version of a reversal of the aging process. Now... Now, mind you, we don't have long-term studies following people over decades to be 100% sure that those people will live for two years or five years or 10 years longer. All we know is that the signposts are pointing in that direction of greater longevity um, mm. and probably via a number of different mechanisms. So, But on a genetic level, uh, it looks like it slows down and possibly even with healthy lifestyle reverses the aging process at least to an extent. I mean, you can't do that forever. <laughs> yeah. you know, telomeres are going to shorten sooner or later. And, um, <laughs> and telomeres are not the only thing that's a, that uh, is an important yeah. signpost for ageing. But there's so many there's so many incredible factors that you've just spoken about, you know, emotional regulation and the ability to to perform better, to to have confidence in our skills, to have less anger and hostility. So the positive effects of of meditation are absolutely profound and so then the the side effects of that is the potential for longevity and uh, less aging um, and all of these you know less inflammation yeah well if I and if I can add sort of a footnote to what I was saying before and to pick up on some of the things you're saying that you know noticing that um, say meditation has these effects from a genetic level physiologically neurologically etc doesn't mean so if we meditate, we'll never get cancer, or if we've got cancer, we just need to meditate and we'll go away. What mm. we're talking about is that it, it can help to take some of the wind out of the sails of the chronic conditions and to do some things to help to support the body's own natural resistance. And uh, so it can help to shift a balance more in our own favour but it needs to be taken in conjunction with all of the other treatments and uh, and everything else that might be necessary for that condition um, mm. or to help the person to cope with that condition emotionally or to cope with the symptoms associated with the condition or the treatment. So it's not like just meditate and everything will, will, will um, go away. But um, it, So it's, it's a really important potential adjunct in the management of um, these conditions. But those yeah. questions you are mentioning before, and like asking people, particularly for men, about anger and hostility, uh, is very important because, you know, if somebody says, you know, and, and to actually try and quantify it, like how often and how angry somebody gets, because that could be a really important part of the management of their heart disease. Mm. You know, so, for example, you know, if somebody gets really, really angry, then within the next two hours, um, depending on their other cardiovascular risk factors, you know, they're eight to nine times more likely to have a heart attack in the following two wow. hours than they would be if they hadn't gotten angry. That is, it can mm. be a trigger for acute events. Or another study was looking at how often somebody gets angry and looking at their other risk factors. And what they found was that, you know, for... Um, uh, people who got angry about, say, five times a day, you know, uh, and that could be just in the traffic and something mm. happens at home and, you know, et cetera. So five times a day, 
And if they got higher cardiac risk factors, there was, uh, what was it, 657 extra cases of cardiovascular disease per 10,000 people per year. Gee. That's a lot. That's a lot That's of increase, lot. over and above what you would expect mm. You know, on, when controlling for the other risk factors. So that's a lot. So, you know, if you're asking this, how often do you get angry, like really angry? And and that may be a really important part of the management. Mm. Um, and a really say, important well, doorway into an opportunity to explore a whole new way of helping reduce down the risk and helping to support their life and helping, you know, helping really to work towards optimising their health, you know, whether they've got these chronic diseases or not. Craig, I have to thank you so much for joining us today to discuss this incredible concept, really, that I don't think gets enough airplay. You know, we've learnt about the role of stress and mindfulness on on epigenetic changes, on our immune function, the role of emotional regulation on health and thickening our prefrontal cortex so that we can become more... You know, productive and optimised and have these incredible forward-thinking planning skills. I I love the concept of holism and whole person care and and, um, this interconnection with ourselves and and the whole of life, really. So it's not just about us being all interconnected, but it's ourselves being interconnected to each other and, and to the community and to the world and to the land and ecology, as you mentioned before as well. And so it was just a pleasure speaking to you today. Well, it's been a pleasure as well for me, Michelle. So uh, I hope it's been useful for all the listeners. And um, and perhaps I haven't said anything like good mental health, importance of healthy lifestyle and diet. Perhaps none of this is new, but maybe uh, a lot of the modern research is just giving people more and more reason to have uh, good good faith in putting those things into effect in, uh, in yeah. our lives. Thanks, everyone, for listening today. Don't forget that you can find all the show notes, transcripts and other resources from today's episode on the FX Medicine website. I'm Dr. Michelle Woolhouse and thanks for joining us. See you next time. This podcast is intended as healthcare practitioner education only and it is not a substitute for medical advice diagnosis or treatment. Make sure you never miss an FX Medicine episode by subscribing to us on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. You can also follow us on LinkedIn, Facebook and Instagram.